So in this video, we're going to cover the gram stain, which is activity 3-7. So the purpose of this activity is to stain and differentiate gram-positive bacteria from gram-negative bacteria. Now, when we say differentiate, we're referring to the fact that the gram stain is a differential stain. And what that means is during the staining procedure, it will allow us to differentiate between gram-positive and gram-negative, which are two different types of bacteria. Now, what you need to be aware of is that gram-positive and gram-negative doesn't refer to the charge on the cell. So it's not that gram-positive are positively charged and gram-negative are negatively charged. That's not what that charge is referring to. It's simply a designation for a type of bacterial cell wall, which you will see in a minute. Now, in a differential stain, again, you're gonna differentiate between bacteria. So a capsule stain would also be a differential stain. It allows us to differentiate between bacteria that produce capsules and those that don't. Endospore stain, acid fast stain, those are stains you're gonna learn about later on. Those are also differential stains. They allow us to differentiate between bacteria that produce an endospore and those that don't, or bacteria that have an acid fast positive cell wall, which means that it has 60% mycolic acid versus those that don't. And so this is just an example of a differential stain. Now, why do we need to stain bacteria in the first place? Well, bacteria are clear or colorless. And so we need to stain them at all to be able to visualize them. In this activity for the gram stain, this gram stain would be done with Citrobacter frundiae and Staphylococcus epidermidis. If you recall back to the aseptic technique video, one of the things that you would do in lab is that you would make a slant of Citrobacter frundiae and your partner would make a slant of Staphylococcus epidermidis. And so when we do our aseptic technique, you would each be responsible for your organism and then you would use those two organisms to do your gram stain. And what you're gonna see is that one of these organisms is going to be a gram positive and one is going to be a gram negative. Now, in the gram stain, we will be using basic dyes to stain the cell. Remember that a basic dye, base is referring to the fact that it accepts hydrogen ions from the solution. And so when it takes hydrogens, the charge on the oxychrome is going to be positively charged. And so the positive charge on the stain is attracted to the negatively charged cell. And so the two dyes that we're gonna use during this procedure is going to be crystal violet. Crystal violet, like the name suggests, is going to stain it purple. And we're gonna use safranin, and safranin will stain the cells like a pinkish red color. And so what we will end up with is that gram positive will end up being purple, and gram negative will end up being red. And so this is what we're gonna see. Now in a minute, you'll see why they end up different colors. Almost all medically important bacteria, about 95%, are either gram positive or gram negative, meaning they fall into one of these two categories. There are some exceptions to the rule, meaning that they don't have a cell wall typical of gram positive, or they don't have a cell wall typical of gram negative, but most medically important bacteria is in fact having a gram reaction, meaning it's either gram positive or gram negative. This is the single most important medical procedure in medical bacteriology, meaning that it's really important to know if a patient, for example, has an infection that's caused by a gram positive or a gram negative infection. And there's two main reasons that this is gonna be really important. One reason is that certain antibiotics are only effective against one type or another. And what I mean by that is if we were to look at penicillin, for example. Penicillin is a drug that inhibits cell wall synthesis. Specifically, it, it inhibits peptidoglycan. Penicillin is effective against gram-positive, but it's not effective against gram-negative. And so if you don't know what type of infection your patient has, and let's say they have a gram-negative infection, and you as the physician prescribe penicillin, that penicillin is not going to be effective to either inhibit or kill 
the bacteria that's causing the infection. And so determining if the patient's infection is caused by a gram positive or gram negative is important so that you choose the right antibiotic. Because again, if you don't choose the right antibiotic, that drug might not be important. Now, what other reason would there be to know? Well, you're gonna see that in just a minute. The other reason has to do with the composition of the cell wall. Specifically, gram negative has something in its, wa its cell wall that's called LPS, lipopolysaccharide. And within that is something called lipid A. Lipid A is an endotoxin, meaning that if lipid A is released into the bloodstream, it might cause the patient to go into shock. And so if you have a patient who has a gram-negative infection, meaning they have bacteria with this lipid A in their cell wall, the way that you treat that might be different than the way that you might treat a gram-positive. Because one of the things that you guys will learn is that when we talk about types of antibiotics, antibiotics can fall into one of two main categories, what are called bacteriostatic, Static or stasis means to stay the same. A drug that is bacteriostatic is going to inhibit the bacteria from growing, but it doesn't necessarily kill them. Now, why might that be useful? Well, because if you inhibit them from dividing, that's gonna give the immune system time to catch up, and it's gonna give the white blood cells time to get rid of that bacterial infection. On the flip side, we have drugs that are bacteriocidal. Cidal means kill those drugs are going to kill the bacteria. Now, if you have a patient that has a gram-negative infection, so this is something you wanna write down, is why choose a, why, why know the gram reaction of a bacteria? Why is that important, right? And so we've already said one, but the other one is that if your patient has a gram-negative infection, you're not going to want to treat with a drug that is bactericidal. Remember that cidal means kill. Because if you kill the cells and they have lipid A in their cell wall and it causes bacteria to rupture or what we call lice, well, then the bacteria is going to release that lipid A into the bloodstream as they break open. And when they release the lipid A into the bloodstream, it might send your patient into shock. And so knowing whether the patient has a gram positive or a gram negative infection also will dictate the type of drug that you use. So if I knew that I have a patient who has a gram negative infection, I might choose to use a drug that is bacteriostatic, meaning it's going to inhibit the cells from dividing, but it's not gonna kill them because I don't want that lipid A to be released and I don't want my patient to go into shock. And so the gram stain is a very quick way that allows us to differentiate between gram positive and gram negative so that we can choose the appropriate antibiotic to treat the patient. So when we're looking at this, this is the cell wall of a gram positive and a gram negative. And you'll notice that they have differences in their cell wall structure. One of the big differences between gram negative and gram positive is the thickness of their peptidoglycan. And so if I look at gram negative, it has a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. And if I compare that to gram positive, gram positive have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. And in fact, it's about eight times thicker than the peptidoglycan in the gram negative. Now, if I look at both gram negative, gram negative being the one on the left and gram positive being the one on the right, Again, you wanna remember that that has nothing to do with charge. Gram negative doesn't have a negative charge and gram positive a positive charge. Both cell types are negatively charged. They're both gonna be stained by basic stains. But what you'll notice that they have in common is that they both have a cytoplasmic or cell or plasma membrane. All of those terms are kind of used interchangeably. Now, in terms of gram negative, they have, again, our thin peptidoglycan. This occupies what is referred to as the periplasmic space. And in the gram negative, they also have this outer membrane. So they have an additional phospholipid bilayer. And within that outer membrane, we have what are called porins. These are these channels. And these channels allow the bacteria to regulate what goes in or out of the cell. 
And so what you'll see later on throughout the semester is that one of the reasons that gram negative are more likely to be resistant to antibiotics is because of the presence of those porins. Having those porins can prevent certain antibiotics from getting in. And so gram negatives have porins, gram positives do not. Gram negative also have, again, that LPS, this lipopolysaccharide. And if we look at this um, in more detail, notice that within there is the lipid A. And so remember I said that the lipid A is an endotoxin. We don't want a lot of that released into the patient's bloodstream, or it might send that patient into shock. And so if the infection is caused by a gram-negative bacteria, you might choose to use a drug that is bacteriostatic, meaning it inhibits cell growth, but it doesn't kill the bacteria. Because again, if I use a drug that's bactericidal, that kills the gram-negative bacteria and it causes it to rupture, then the gram-negative bacteria is gonna release that LPS and release that lipid A into the patient's bloodstream and the patient could go into shock. And so again, this is one of the reasons why it's important to know whether the infection is gram-negative or gram-positive. Now, if I compare that to gram-positive, so here is my gram-positive cell wall. Again, it has a very thick peptidoglycan. It also does not have an outer membrane, does not have porins, it does not have LPS. It does, however, have a chemical within it that's called tachoic acid. We have wall tachoic acid, which is basically gonna span the peptidoglycan and it's gonna hold the peptidoglycan together. And we also have our lipotachoic acid, lipothink lipids. It's embedded in the cell membrane, but it also spans the cell wall. And so these are just some differences between gram positive and gram negative. And what you're gonna see in a minute is that it's actually the thickness of the peptidoglycan which is going to influence the way that they stain, meaning it's going to influence whether or not they keep the color and whether or not they're gonna be purple or red at the end of this procedure. So when we do our gram stain, one of the things that I wanna point out is there will be another part to this where I will actually demonstrate the procedure, but for now I'm just going to explain it and then I will demonstrate it. So when we do our gram stain, one of the first things that we need to do is we need to make what's called a heat fix bacterial smear. And so what you do in this procedure is that you would label on the frosted side of the slide. So on the edge of the slide, there's a part that's frosted and it makes it easier to label. And so you would label it with your name or your initials. You would label it with gram for gram stain and then you would label it SE and CF. Remember that when we do this procedure, we're using two bacteria. We're gonna use Staphylococcus epidermidis and we're gonna use Citrobacter frondii. We're gonna do both. One is gram positive, one is gram negative. So we start by labeling our slide. Then we're gonna place a drop of water on a slide so that the puddle of water is approximately a nickel size. So what we do to do this is I use a squirt bottle and I add a little bit of water to a loop and then I put that water on the slide. And again, I want that circle of water to be about the size of a nickel. Now, what I'm gonna do after that, so I have my water on my slide, I have to work quickly because I don't want that water to drop off, to dry out. So one of your questions in your question sets when it was in the simple stain, it said, what is wrong with the procedure for the heat fix smear on page 186? The problem is, is that the book says to use a loop, that you transfer bacteria using a loop. Notice what I did here is I bolded it and I put you a little note that you wanna use a needle. The reason you want to use a needle is so that you don't pick up too much bacteria. So that's a key, so make yourself a note. You wanna use a needle so that you don't pick up too much bacteria. So my loop in this case was only to put water on the slide. It just makes it a lot easier to squirt the water using the loop to put it on with the loop than it would be to try and squirt the squirt bottle on the slide. So when you have your water on your slide, then you need to add your bacteria. And you're gonna add your bacteria using your aseptic technique. So I would take my needle, 
I would flame sterilize it. I would let it cool. Then I would go in to one of the two bacteria because remember there's going to be two bacteria on the slide. So then I would go into my bacteria. Let's say we start with SE first and using my aseptic technique, I would pick up some of the bacteria and then I would swirl it in the water. So I would take that needle and I would add the bacteria to the water. Now I need to add a second bacteria to the slide. So what I'm gonna do is then I would take my needle and I would re-flame sterilize it because I wanna get rid of the SE that's on there. So I flame sterilize it. Then I go into my slant that has Citrobacter frondii. And I pick up a little bit of this bacteria, pick up some CF. Then I'm going to stir it into the water. I actually stir the two bacteria into the same puddle of water. Now, in this case, the reason we do it this way is because for those two bacteria, one of them is going to be gram negative and one of them is going to be gram positive. So when we look under the microscope, we should have a mixture that is both pink cells and red cells because one organism is gram positive and the other is going to be gram negative. And so we want to do this on the same slide so that the slides, the samples are treated the same. And you're gonna see in a little bit that the most important step during the gram stain procedure where it becomes differential is going to be at the step that we call the decolorizer. And so we want to have these on the same slide so that they receive the same amount of decolorization. And so we know we should see one that's reddish pink and one that's going to be purple. And so we would use a needle and our aseptic technique and transfer both bacteria onto the same puddle of water. Now, when I put the bacteria on the slide, it says put it into an emulsion. An emulsion basically means just to mix it together. So we would emulsify the bacteria, we would mix it. And when we do this, we take that water that was about the size of a nickel and we make that circle of water a little bit larger. Typically, it's going to go to about the size of a quarter. So our puddle of water gets a little bit larger and then we would air dry our slide on a slide warmer that's set to 45 degrees Celsius. And so we just want to air dry it. So we want that water and that bacteria to be dry. And then we're going to do what's called a heat fix step. And what we do in our heat fix step is that we take our slide and we pass it through the flame three times. So what I do is I go one and back, two and back, and three and back. And so once I pass it through the flame three times, now I have my heat fix smear. Now, why do we need to air dry it before we do the heat fix step? The answer is, is that if I leave that as a liquid and I leave that, that liquid on the slide and then I pass it through the flame, that might cause the bacteria that's in that water to splatter, right? When things boil, they could splatter. So I don't wanna leave that slide wet before I do my heat fix step. I need to dry it. I need to air dry it first, make it so my puddle of water dries, and then three passes through the flame. Then I'm gonna heat fix, because again, if it's wet, it's gonna cause potentially the bacteria to splatter. So now let's look at what is the purpose of the heat fix step. Why do we have to heat fix our, our um, slide compared to say our negative stain that we looked at? So purpose, why do we heat fix the slide? Well, first let's talk about what does heat do, right? Heat, when applied to things, is going to increase molecular motion. Molecules are gonna move faster. And so what we are doing when we heat fix, one, we're gonna kill the cells because the bacteria can't tolerate that very high heat. It's going to kill them. So one of the reasons is that we want to kill the bacteria that's on the slide. Because what you're gonna see is that when we do this procedure, we are gonna do several steps which involve basically the dye running across the slide. And we don't want those cells to be living. We don't wanna contaminate our work area. So we have to do our heat fix step to kill the cells. And so the second reason we heat fix bacteria is that it adheres bacteria to the slide. 
Basically, what that means is it allows the bacteria to stick to the slide. And that's important because, again, when we do our washes and we do our different steps, we don't want the bacteria to come off the slide. We want the bacteria to be stuck to the slide. Now, the mechanism and the third reason that we heat fix is that what heat fixing does is that it causes proteins to denature and coagulate. And so what that means is that proteins are a type of macromolecule and proteins are held together by different types of interactions among the R groups, meaning the variable portions of the amino acids. And so there are ionic bonds holding that protein together, there are covalent bonds, there are hydrophobic interactions, there are just different types of bonds that will hold that protein in its correct shape. Now, proteins only function if they're folded into their correct shape. So if we heat proteins, remember that heat is going to increase molecular motion. Molecules are going to start to move faster. And as a result, when those proteins, when those um, amino acids and that molecule starts to move faster, it's going to break the bonds that hold that protein together. And the protein's going to denature. It's going to unfold and when it denatures and when it unfolds, when we say that it coagulates, it basically means that it they stick together. So again, notice that the purpose was to adhere bacteria to the slide. One of the ways that they adhere the bacteria to the slide is that the proteins will coagulate, they will stick together, which allows the bacteria to stick to the slide. Think about if you've ever cooked an egg before, right? The egg starts out liquid, However, when you apply heat, it becomes a solid and it starts to stick together. That's because the proteins in the egg will denature and coagulate. And so these are the three reasons that we heat fix a smear. We want to kill the bacterial cells, we want to adhere bacteria to the slide, and proteins denature and coagulate. That's the mechanism behind killing the cells and adhering bacteria to the slide. And so it's really important that we do that heat fix step. It's really important that students pass that slide through the flame. One of the biggest ways when students fail in their gram stain is that they simply forgot the heat fix step. And if you forget that heat fix step, well, now your cells are not going to adhere to the slide. And when you do the procedure, you're going to wash away that bacteria and you're not going to have anything left. So it's important that we don't forget to heat fix the slide. We need to pass it through the flame three times in order to kill the bacteria, adhere the bacteria to the slide, and to cause the proteins to denature and coagulate. So once we do our heat fix smear, then we would move on to our actual staining procedure. And so this is the staining procedure for the gram stain. Now, for most of the other techniques when it comes to staining, I don't make you memorize the steps, meaning I don't make you memorize what is the order of the dyes, you know, how long do you do them. This is the exception to that. For this technique, you must know this procedure. So the first step in the procedure, so after you make your heat fix smear, you're going to apply the primary stain. Primary stain means the first stain. So what that means is that you're going to add crystal violet to your slide. So you just cover your little puddle where your bacteria is. You cover it with crystal violet without touch touching the dropper to the slide because we don't want to contaminate the dropper. But we add our crystal violet to our slide and we let it sit for one minute. So we let it sit and the crystal violet is a basic stain, so it's going to stain the bacterial cells. So we let it sit for one minute and then we are going to dump the crystal violet off. So we discard it into a waste container and then we're gonna wash with deionized water. And so all we do is we take our squirt bottle and we squirt the water above where the bacteria is and we let the water run down the slide just to get rid of any excess crystal violet that did not get into the cells. So crystal violet for one minute and then rinse. Then you would lay your slide back flat and you would do what's called the mordant. And the mordant in this case is going to be iodine. And if you think of like brick and mortar, mortar like holds brick together. The mordant, the iodine is used to form a crystal violet iodine complex. 
basically to make that crystal violet larger so that it's retained within the cell. So we add our iodine to our slide and we let it sit for one minute. After one minute is up, we are going to dump the iodine off. We're gonna add water and we're gonna rinse. Then we get to step number three. The third step is the decolorization step. This is the single most important step in the entire procedure. So on your notes, you wanna put a star next to decolorization. That is the most important step in the entire procedure. That is the step that has to be timed perfectly because if it's not timed perfectly, you won't end up with a differential stain. And so you'll see why this is true in a minute. So when you do the decolorization, you are going to use an acetone alcohol solution and you place your dropper over there and you're just going to allow the decolorization solution to run across your slide until the liquid coming off is clear. Now that's really important. It's not that the slide is clear. You don't need to get rid of all the dye that's on your slide, but you do need to do it until the liquid coming off is clear. And so again, when I demonstrate the technique in a video, you will be able to see what that actually looks like. But I basically will do that until the dye runs clear, meaning until the liquid coming off is gonna be clear. So there is no exact time for this. There's not one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds. There's not an absolute time. It's simply until the liquid coming off is clear. After you see the liquid coming off being clear, then you're going to again rinse with your deionized water. So you're gonna add some deionized water across the top, let it run down. That's gonna rinse the slide. Then you're gonna lay that, that slide flat again and you're gonna apply the secondary stain or what we call the counter stain. And for this step, you are going to use safranin. Safranin is also a basic stain and you're gonna add the safranin for one minute, let it sit, and then after one minute, you're gonna dump it and rinse it. And you can, in our case, we take chem wipes and we can wipe the bottom to get rid of the excess water or liquid that might be on there. And you could use very carefully a chem wipe on the top to blot it. You don't wipe. If I were to wipe the top of my slide, all my bacteria goes with it. So I would not wipe my slide, but I could very gently pat it with a chem wipe to get rid of the excess liquid. And then you would be ready to view your gram stain under the microscope, right? And because we're viewing bacteria, we would need to go all the way to a thousand X. So we would have to go to our oil immersion lens so that we could visualize what that would look like. So I'm going to go and show you an animation. This used to be publicly available on this microbe library website. That website is currently down. It's no longer um, available, but I do have the animation and I am gonna show you what that animation looks like so that you can kind of understand better how the gram stain works. So here is the animation that's going to walk through what happens in each step. So we're going to start this by talking about what happens in the case of gram positives. So here you're looking at the cell wall and cell membrane of a gram positive bacteria. Remember that the gram positive has a cell membrane. All cells have a cell membrane. So here is our phospholipid bilayer. And then in the case of gram positive, it's going to have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. Within that, we have our wall tachoic acids or our lipotachoic acids that hold the peptidoglycan together, that cross-link the peptidoglycan. So this is our gram-positive cell wall. We add our crystal violet. Crystal violet, remember, is a basic stain. It carries a positive charge, so it's attracted to the negatively charged cells. So at this point, gram-positive cells are stained purple. We add the iodine. The iodine again acts as the mordant. And so what's gonna happen is, is that the iodine is now gonna get into the cell. And when it gets into the cell, it's gonna bond with the crystal violet and it forms this crystal violet iodine complex. Basically meaning that it makes those dye molecules larger 
so that the dye is more likely to be retained. So we formed our crystal violet iodine complex. At this point, the cells are still purple. We add our decolorizer. Remember that the decolorizer is the most important step of the entire procedure. And in our case, our decolorizer is an acetone alcohol mix. So let's see what's gonna happen. So we add the decolorizer. It's going to cause the peptidoglycan to shrink. It's gonna dehydrate or start to break down the peptidoglycan. However, because gram positive have a thick layer of peptidoglycan, it doesn't dissolve it all the way. There is still peptidoglycan intact. And so as a result, the dye molecules are not gonna leave, they're going to be retained. So if I time this correctly in the decolorizer step, because the peptidoglycan layer is quite large, that is going to keep peptidoglycan intact, which is going to allow gram positive to retain the crystal violet. So meaning after decolorization, they will still be purple because the decolorizer did not get rid of that peptidoglycan and the crystal violet was maintained or is still in the cell. So then I follow up with my secondary stain, which is my safranin. Safranin, again, remember, is a basic stain. It carries a positive charge. So when I add the safranin, it is going to go into the cell. It's still gonna get in. However, the red or the pinkish red is lighter than the purple. And so what you see when you look at this is that they're still going to be purple because it's not that the red, it's not that the safranin didn't get in. The safranin does get in. You just don't see it because the purple is darker than the red. And so at the end of the gram stain for gram positive, they are going to appear purple because the thick layer of peptidoglycan allowed the crystal violet to be retained, meaning it stays in and the cells end up purple. And so when we look at our gram positive under the microscope, you'll notice that the cells would stain purple. That would be your gram positive. They look purple at the end because that thick layer of peptidoglycan is going to allow the crystal violet to be retained. So now let's walk through and look at what happens in gram negative. So we're gonna select our gram negative. And remember that the composition of the gram negative cell wall is different than that of the gram positive. So we have a thinner layer of peptidoglycan. And in fact, they probably drew this much larger than it actually is because again, remember that it's eight times thinner than gram positive, but you still get the idea. We have a, a thin layer of peptidoglycan we have our outer membrane, and our outer membrane has porins or channels which can regulate what goes in or out. And it also has our LPS or our lipopolysaccharide. So let's look at what happens in a gram negative. So we add our crystal violet. Crystal violet is a basic stain, so it does get into the gram negative. We add our iodine, which is our mordant. Same idea here. The iodine gets into the cell, iodine is gonna bond with the crystal violet, and we end up with our crystal violet iodine complex. And that crystal violet, crystal violet iodine complex makes the crystal violet larger so that it may be retained. So now we're gonna add our decolorizer. And again, most important step in the entire procedure. So we add our decolorizer, and it's able to dissolve that outer membrane because the outer membrane is a phospholipid bilayer and so the alcohol will dissolve that outer membrane and it will pretty much shrink the peptidoglycan so much that during decolorization, the crystal violet is going to leave the cell because that peptidoglycan layer is not intact. Again, in this animation, it looks like it's quite larger than it actually is, but what you really need to realize is that because it has a thin layer of peptidoglycan, when we add the decolorizer and it shrinks that peptidoglycan, now the crystal violet can come out. 
And so notice that after decolorization, what color are the bacteria at this point? And the answer is, is that the bacteria are colorless. They have lost their crystal violet. This is why we have to add our secondary stain or what we call our counter stain. And that is that we have to add safranin because in order to visualize gram negative, they have to be stained. Remember that cells are, are clear. So we add the safranin. The safranin is going to be a basic stain. So it's going to go into the gram negative cell. And so at this point, the gram negative is going to have that reddish pink appearance because it lost its peptidoglycan. But when we add our secondary stain, when we add our safranin, the safranin gets in and now those gram negative cells appear to be that pink red color. And so if we look under the scope, we would then see these pink or red cells because again, they lost their crystal violet and instead they took up the safranin. So now back to filling in our slides. So we're gonna walk through and we're gonna put on our slides what color gram positive and gram negative would be after each step in the gram stain. So again, our crystal violet is our first step. It's our primary stain. Notice if you look at your notes, crystal violet, iodine, and safranin were all steps that, that went for one minute. The acetone alcohol is the only step that is not one minute. It's until the liquid coming off is clear. But the other three, it's easy to remember because they're all one minute steps. So we start with our crystal violet, which is going to be our primary stain. And so we add it and both cells are gonna stain, both gram positive and gram negative are going to stain with the crystal violet. So gram positives will be purple, gram negatives will be purple. Now I just drew these as circles or rods, circles meaning spheres. They could be, gram positive could be spherical, they could be caucus, or they could be bacillus shaped. Gram negative could be bacillus shaped or caucus shaped, but for simplicity, I made the gram positive be the caucus and the gram negative be the bacillus shaped. So adding our crystal violet or our primary stain, at this point, both cells are gonna be purple. So then I add the iodine. Remember that the iodine is referred to as the mordant. And so when I add the iodine, the iodine is going to get in and it's gonna form a crystal violet iodine complex. Basically, it's going to bind to the crystal violet and it's gonna make those crystal violet molecules larger so that they're more likely to be retained within the cell. So for gram positive, they're still purple. Gram negative, they are still purple because the iodine just formed that crystal violet iodine complex. It doesn't change the color. Then we get to our acetone alcohol solution. Again, that is our decolorizer. That is the single most important step of the entire procedure. Gram positive, remember, has a thick layer of peptidoglycan. Gram negative does not. So if we time this properly, right, the decolorizer is going to break down the peptidoglycan in the gram negative, but not in the gram positive because the gram negative has a peptidoglycan layer that is eight times thinner than that of gram positive. So we are going to add the decolorizer and it's going to remove the dye from the gram negative. So in gram positive, they're gonna be purple because they have a thick peptidoglycan and the acetone alcohol is not going to be able to get the crystal violet out. So they will still be purple, but gram negative at this point are going to be colorless because they have a thin peptidoglycan and when that thin peptidoglycan gets dissolved, the crystal violet dye is going to come out. And so the last step is going to be to add the safranin. And the safranin, again, is our secondary stain or our counter stain. Either term is used interchangeably. Remember that that stain is a basic stain. 
So will it stain gram positive? And the answer is yes. Technically, the safranin does get in. However, it's not seen because the purple is darker than the red. So the gram positive will still appear purple at the end of this procedure because they have a thick peptidoglycan, which allows the crystal violet to be retained. Gram negative, when we add the decolorizer, it lost its color. So when we add the safranin, the safranin is gonna go in and it's gonna stain the gram negative, that pinkish red color. And that is that because they became colorless during the acetone alcohol step, then they took up the secondary stain and they appeared pinkish red. And so this is kind of an overview of what happens during our gram stain. Now let's talk about why that acetone alcohol step is so critical. And the reason is, is that the timing of that really matters. Because if I don't run the decolorizer long enough, if I don't do that step long enough, gram negative are going to not lose their peptidoglycan and gram negative would still be purple. We would say that we under decolorized at that point, that we didn't run it long enough. And as a result, our gram negative is going to appear purple because it's not long enough to get the peptidoglycan broken down. So that is under decolorization. We don't add the decolorizer long enough. On the flip side, we could over decolorize. And what that means is that we could make it or add it for too long. Because if you run it for too long, if you do that step for too long, well then not only are you going to remove the peptidoglycan and the gram negative, but because you're doing that step for so long, it's also gonna remove the crystal violet in the gram positive. And if that happens, when the peptidoglycan shrinks too much in the gram positive, the gram positive are gonna become colorless after the decolorizer step because we have shrunk the peptidoglycan too much and as a result, gram positive will end up being colorless at the decolorizer step and therefore at the end would be pink red just like gram negative. And so it's really important that we time our acetone alcohol solution just right so that we remove the peptidoglycan from the gram negative, but keep it intact for the gram positive. And that step is what allows it to be differential, meaning we can differentiate between gram positive and negative. Because at the end of this procedure, gram positive should be purple and gram negative should be pink red. And so this step is going to be critical. Now, when we do gram stains, we want our cultures to be young and actively dividing. If we use cultures that have been old, have been around for too long, those cells might become what we call gram variable, meaning that just from the age of the culture, it could make that effect the structure of the cell wall. And so we'd end up with an abnormal result if we're not using young cultures, because if the cultures are old, they will produce some variability in the way that they stain. And so it's critical that we use these young, actively dividing cultures. So if we look at our gram stain results, on the left, I'm showing you a picture that our lab technician took and he gram stained a gram negative rod, which is a bacillus. And specifically, we're looking at E. coli. And so you can see little tiny pink rods or little tiny bacillus shaped gram negative. Notice that they are pink red, which tells you in fact that these are gram negative. If this was done with Citrobacter frundii, just like we saw in yours, those would end up also looking very much like this, little pink rods. For our gram stain, another example, we have a gram positive here, and these are our gram positive cock, cock size shape, basically meaning they're spheres, and they're in clusters, and so these are staphylococcus. Staphylo, remember, refers to grape-like clusters. Coccus refers to the spheres. And so this bacteria are these clusters of these purple little spheres or circles. 
This picture is Staph aureus, but again, Staph epidermidis, which is the one that we would have used, would appear this way as well. Now, notice in this example, I'm showing you two separate pictures. I'm showing you the gram negative separated from the gram positive. However, when I told you to do it in this experiment, I told you to mix the two cultures together, that you actually put them in the same circle so that when we stain them, we would expect that one of the bacteria should end up pink and they should be rods and one of the bacteria should be spheres and be purple. And so we, if we do them together, we can ensure that the timing of that step is correct. Because if you think about it, if I did Citrobacter on one slide and I did Staph epidermidis on the other, if they're on separate slides, there's no real way to control the timing of the decolorization step. Remember that that step is critical, that's where it becomes a differential stain. And so I could end up with, you know, two slides that are pink, I could end up with two slides that are purple. Basically, because you're treating the slides differently, they could be over decolorized, they could be under decolorized. The only way to know for sure that they're not is that if we do them either side by side, or in this case, if we mix them together, we expect that we get one that's pink red and another one that's going to be purple. And so just go back if you wanna see them mixed together. In one of the beginning slides, you can actually see the two bacteria mixed together and see in fact that you do have two bacteria. One is gram negative and one is gram positive. And so this is what you would look at for your gram stain. So I have a question for you to get you thinking. What would each step look like if we accidentally added the safranin first and the crystal violet second. So this is going to require some critical thinking skills. So let's assume that these are in fact backwards. So we can cross this one out and this would be safranin. And let's say that we cross this one out and it's now crystal violet. So I want you to think about what would it look like if we accidentally switched our stains. If we did our safranin first and our crystal violet second. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is I want you to try and fill this in before our Zoom session on this topic because I want to have you guys attempt this and then talk with people in your lab and see if you guys came up with the same answers and see is there an actual reason that we do crystal violet first and saffron in second. And so I just want you to think about that and that concludes this video.